Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Luke. The Gospel Record of Luke and chapter number 9. The Gospel Record of Luke and chapter number 9. Now as we've been going through the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as portrayed in the gospel record of Luke. We know that the gospel record of Luke is written by Dr. Luke, and we know that this is the most researched book, and there's a lot of details in it. In this stage of Jesus' life, he is now making the preparation to make the walk, to take the travel, to go to Jerusalem. And once he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be put on an illegal false trial. He is going to be sentenced to death. He is going to be... Um, beaten, he's going to be scourged, he's going to be put on the cross where he dies for your sins and dies for mine. And then on the third day he rose again. Now as he is traveling back down to Jerusalem, he is also trying to train the disciples. And in the gospel record of Luke chapter number 9, Jesus Christ is over and over and over working with his disciples to get their attention, to bring them to himself, to do a work. And we're going to pick this up at the very end end of the gospel record of Luke chapter number 9. And I want you to look with me starting at verse number 57. The gospel record of Luke chapter 9 in verse number 57. The word of God says this. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nest, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my, at home at my house. And Jesus said unto them, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And with this, we could see, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, mark this first. There are two phrases that I want you to mark in the gospel record of Luke chapter number 9. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 51, the phrase, me first. Me first. Then notice with me in verse number 61, that same phrase, me first. Me first. First, And with this, we have the historical account of three people that Jesus Christ has invited, challenged, commanded to follow after him. And we could see their response, which is going to be me first. And I'd like to preach a message from here of three calls to discipleship. Three calls to discipleship. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you, we're just asking that you would give us grace, that you would give us mercy, that you would help us to have understanding. And I'm praying that you would use this message to help bring someone to the choice. Am I going to follow after Christ or am I not? What does it look like? What does it mean to follow after Him? What is this choice that we have? I'm praying that you would grab a hold of hearts, that you be working hearts, that they would make a clear personal, realistic decision to follow after you. And Lord, I don't have the words, I don't have the ability, I don't have the skill, nor is it my job to convince these people to follow you. It is your job, Holy Spirit, to be working in the hearts to draw them. I'm praying that you would bless your word, that you would give me the wisdom and knowledge to state your word properly and trusting that your Holy Spirit would do your own work today. Thank you that I could trust you in these things Get victories today in someone's life. In Jesus' name, amen. 
in this story, this historical account, this isn't just a fictional story, these are three incidents that occur where they come and they have the choice to follow after Christ. Now with that, let's kind of hit some context. Remember that the gospel record of Luke was written by Dr. Luke. And Dr. Luke knew a little bit about following after the Lord. He had been a slave and had gotten his freedom after he had gotten a medical degree. He was actually licensed from the organization from Rome. He had gotten his freedom. And he had made a choice after he got saved to follow the Lord. And he left his medical practice. He could have done so many things. And personally followed the Apostle Paul as one of his ministry team. And he was the personal physician for Paul to keep him going, to keep him go, uh, moving forward. And so Luke knew something about it. Remember that each book has its own theme. We know that Jesus is the center of the gospel record of Luke, that it's traveling the life and ministry of Je uh, Jesus Christ while he was here on the earth. But the overtones, the theme of the gospel record of Luke is discipleship. Over and over and over, you see this call to follow after me, follow after me, follow after me. You see that written all throughout here. That is Paul is experiencing that Demas had forsaken me, loving this present world. As he's watched people walk away, that I am alone, only um, Mark is with me. <laughs> he, uh, only Luke is with me, he says. We could see that this, there's a, a dearth, something missing of commitment of following after Christ. Now, in the gospel, um, excuse me, in Luke's writings, even though he's written two books, he writes more content than any other New Testament writer. There's more into it. And with this big theme, both in the gospel record of Luke and the book of Acts, you see this idea of discipleship, of making a decision to follow after Christ. This is the theme. This is the heartbeat. This is what you see over and over and over. Now normally when we think about discipleship, we see the success stories. We see the people that make a decision to follow after Christ and we watch how their life changes. We see how they respond. We see how God uses them. But God also takes us and sees the other side. What about the people who did not choose to follow after Christ? What happened to them? What occurred to them? What happened? And with this, as Jesus Christ is dealing with three different individuals, the gospel record of Luke records this for us. And may we say that most people who choose not to follow after Christ is going to fit in one of these three categories. One of these three responses is going to be the same response that others have when they decide not to follow after Christ. So this is a pivotal story, a biblical account, an historical account that we can learn quite a bit about this idea of what it means to follow after Christ. These three calls to discipleship. The first man that we have here, he's going to be warm-hearted, but he's in unprepared. He's impulsive. The second man, we can see that he's half-hearted. He's unwilling and he has an insincere response. The third man, he's cold-hearted. He's unfit and an indecisive response. Let's look at these men individually as they are having an invitation, a call, a commandment to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the first man. We see him in verse number 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man came unto him. Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now notice this man comes up to the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes to Jesus. And he's already excited. He's heard about what Jesus has done. Heard about the miracles. Lord, I'm going to follow you wheresoever thou goest. Now that's pretty amazing because God has already placed an emphasis on this in the gospel record of um, Luke chapter 6 where it talks about uh, that many people were going to go up to him and say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus said, I never knew thee. It's easy to say Lord. The word Lord carries the idea of master. It also carries the idea in another place of teacher. And so this guy comes up and says, you're my master. I'm going to follow after you. You're my teacher. I want to learn from you. I want to come. I, I'm, I, I want to. He's excited. He's ready to go. 
In the gospel record of Matthew, when it gives this thing, it gives him that he comes up and says, teacher. Now this is, gives us some more of the idea of the story that he says, I'm going to follow that. Uh, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now back in that world, when you went to go learn from a teacher, you didn't sit in a classroom for eight hours. Teachers were itinerant. They would go travel around. And when someone says, I'm going to go learn under you, what they would do is pack a bag. And they would travel with the teacher and learn from them. And the teaching method back then is that the teacher would teach and the student would ask questions and he would answer and then the teacher would ask questions. And it was an involved thing. But he's saying, I'm going to pack my bags. I'm going to follow with you. I'm going to travel with you. I'm going to go with you. I've made a decision. This is what I want. This is great. I'm going to go. Now, normally we would hear that and our normal response, let's good. Let's get to the piano and play. I surrender all. Come just as I am. Come to the altar right now. This is a great decision. But notice what Jesus Christ does. Jesus Christ is always honest with people. Notice what he said in verse 58. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nest. But the son of man hath not where to lay his head. So he comes up and he doesn't say, I'm like a fox or I'm like a bird. He's saying, let me tell you, foxes, they have somewhere to go. They have a home. Birds, they have a nest. But let me tell you, I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. Things are going to be difficult. Things are going to be hard. And you know what? We, we go to verse number 59 and we're going to the other man. What happened to the first man? <coughs> Nothing. He didn't follow God. So it came to the idea, this guy, he heard a message. Could you imagine what it'd be like to hear from Jesus Christ? Man, this is wonderful. I get to hear this. Oh, yes, yes. And he makes an, an impulsive decision. He's, he's, he's warm hearted towards it. But he's unprepared. I'm going to follow you. This is for me. I want to follow you. And Jesus says, okay, good, good. I'm glad you do. Let me tell you, it's not going to be easy to follow me. And you could, as the man thinks about it, oh, I thought it was going to be easy. Well, if it's not going to be convenient, if it's going to be difficult, then maybe this isn't for me. I want to follow you as long as it's easy, but if it's not easy, then uh, never mind. I've got something else. And he shuffles away. This is a normal response. That we can preach the word of God. And the word of God open up. And someone say, oh, this is amazing. That's it. That's what I need. That's great. Oh, I'm going to follow it. And then they walk out the doors. And something gets in their way. Oh, man, I haven't been on church on Sunday night for a while. I'm going to make it tonight. Hey, my favorite show's on tonight. Well, I think I'll just catch it later. And they stay and watch the TV show. Because it got inconvenient. It got hard. Oh, oh, uh, I want to follow after God, but I got to come on a Wednesday night. That, that's, oh, that's, uh, that's too much. And they come up with an excuse. It becomes hard. They are willing to follow God when it's convenient. But Jesus is saying, listen, it's not always convenient to follow me. There's a difficulty here. Are you willing to follow me when it's hard? Are you willing to follow me when it's convenient, inconvenient? Are you willing to follow me when it disrupts your schedule? And the man, no, no. I was excited about it early, but when I realized there is a cost to it, no, no. By the way, this is why an invitation is so important. Now, an invitation is not where we just say, hey, i just making a decision to follow after Christ. We teach people that you need to make a real decision. That a real decision is three parts. First of all, it must be personable. Meaning that you use the personal pronouns. I, me. There's nothing like someone come up and say, man, preacher, you really let so-and-so have it today. Or man, preacher, I wish so-and-so was here. They really needed this message. Well, that's not using personal pronouns. God was trying to preach to you. He knew who was here. He knew who was listening to the message. This was for me. What I need to do with this message. It must be personal. It also needs to be practical. That carries the idea that it's something that you could do. For example, I could preach, read your Bible. It only takes 72 hours to read your Bible from cover to cover. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. 
And so someone say, oh man, I need to read my Bible. God's speaking to me. My heart's warm. I want to be obedient. So Lord, I'm going to read my entire Bible tomorrow. Well, is that practical? No, not at all. But could they make a decision? Well, tomorrow I'm going to read my Bible for 15 minutes. Is that practical? Yes, they can make a real decision. Part of our problem is we make vague decisions. When God speaks to us and we want to come up and we make vague decisions. And we wonder why they don't get followed through. So not only does it need to be personable, not only needs to be practical, but it needs to be measurable. Measurable. What do you mean by that? It carries the idea that I need to make a decision that is so real and tangible, I can look and see, did I keep it? So if I said, Lord, I'm going to read my Bible every morning at 8 o'clock for 15 minutes. Is that personal? Yes. Is it practical? Yes. Is it measurable? Yes. I can look back at the end of the week, did I keep my decision? That was the idea of making a real decision. But what ends up happening is that we preach from the Bible. And you got people who are not against the Bible. They're warm hearted. And God speaks to them and they're going, this is great. This is wonderful. Oh, I need this. And then they don't make a decision. And they walk out the doors and it's gone. God was speaking to them. And they didn't do anything with it. Because they didn't make a real decision. You know, if you say, I'm going to read my Bible if I have time, you'll never have time. I'm going to make it to church as long as I'm feeling good. You'll never feel good. Well, I'm going to pray as long as that you'll never have that. This is an idea here that they're, they're not against Christ. They're not, they're not cold. They're not saying, I hate you, preacher. Their heart's warm. God's speaking to them. And they make an impulsive decision. But they weren't prepared to follow up with it. They didn't realize that when I said I'm going to read my Bible every day, that means in the days that I don't feel like reading my Bible. I'm going to show up to church all the time, even the days I don't feel like showing up to church. I'm going to pray every day. That means the days that you feel like everything's in your way. The idea of following after God, there's sometimes it's not going to be convenient. Sometimes it's going to be difficult. And God's calling. If God speaks to you and it's clear and your heart's warm, you should respond. But you need to respond properly. And that's why so many people, I go to church and I even say a little prayer, Lord, help me to read my Bible more. And it never happens because you never made a decision, a real decision. A decision that you're going to keep no matter what. And so, why is it that some people don't follow after God? God's clearly speaking. It's because they've never made a proper decision. And when it gets tough, when it gets difficult, they quit. And next thing you know, they fall into obscurity. Someone who doesn't make a decision that they're going to be faithful to church... Something's going to keep them out of church. And then something else is going to keep them out of church. And then they start missing church so much that they no longer miss church. They go to obscurity. Where did this guy go? He's never mentioned again. Because he faded away. No one ever saw him. That is a common thing that happens. It wasn't because they're evil. They were warm. God responded. Spoke to them. But they didn't respond properly. They weren't responding with an idea that it's... Not just going to be convenient, but it's going to be inconvenient. I'm going to follow God even if it's inconvenient. So we have the first man, warm-hearted, but he was unprepared. Had a, 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 um, an impulsive response. But then we come to the second guy. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 59. And he, that's Jesus, said to another, follow me. Notice this demand of discipleship. What is discipleship? Follow me. Now, notice this is not a suggestion. It's not, it would be nice to follow me or you should think about following me. This was a command. Follow me. There's a lot of people out there who said, we need to obey God's commands. There's one. Follow me. How about that command? This is a clear command. Draw. Follow me. But notice this man's response. He's half-hearted. He's unwilling. Notice what he says. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first. You want to know what the death of discipleship is? Me first. 
Because following after Christ means you are following him. But if you say me first, you can't follow God. It's one or the other. Who are you following? God or me? Me first is the death of discipleship. Me first is what causes it where (coughs) you put yourself before Christ. And you can't follow after Christ if you're following after self. But me first. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. So it sounds like an honest request. Lord, allow me first. Please allow me first to go bury my father. Okay. Well, this is an important thing. That in the Jewish culture, it was up to the oldest to make sure that the, the younger was or that the, uh, their parents were properly buried and taken care of. If they didn't, it was considered scandalous. It was his responsibility. And he says, suffer me first to go bury my father. Now, some have some differing opin- opinions on exactly the scenario here. There are some people who soften the blow and say, well, the idea was that his dad wasn't dead yet. And so he wants to stay until his dad dies. And then he's going to make sure that the funeral arrangements and stuff are taken care of. I want to do my my thing. But me first. Let me do this first. There's others that will say, no, no, no. Even if this was emergent and his dad was dead, there was an idea that it's not our timing. It's God's timing. If he says, follow me now, that means follow me now. But regardless of the situation, notice with me verse 60. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But thou go and preach the kingdom of God. Here's a man That God said, follow me now. You know, when we're following after Christ, it's not our timing, it's his timing. But it is amazing when we have this me first. People will say, oh, I knew I need to do this, but let me first. Let me wait till my kids are grown. Let me wait till I finish this degree. Let me retire. Let me, and they come up with all these delays of following after Christ. I'll follow God, but... And I have to wait for this. I'll follow after God when this bill is paid. I'll follow after God when my kids leave the house. I'll follow after God when my kids graduate. I'll follow after God. And they give this delay. This is a half-hearted response. What it is is that they're unwilling. When they're giving an excuse. Oh, I'll follow God that's insincere. I'll follow after you, but let me first. Let me first. First, And they give a reason why they can't follow God now. Now, some people said if his father is dead, that's a reasonable excuse. But let me tell you, it's an excuse nonetheless. Whether it's reasonable or unreasonable, if you give an excuse for not following God, you're not following God. Me first. And so many times, this is a common thing. Hey, when are you going to start being faithful to church? Well... I got to get this taken care of first. Well, I'd like to, but hey, when are you going to start reading your Bible? Well, that sounds good, but I need to take care of these other things first. Hey, when are you going to start telling people about the Lord? Well, and they come up with an excuse, a delay, why they can't obey. That's the death of discipleship. Jesus said, oh, follow me. That was a command. And they gave excuse of why they could not. This is a historical person, but it fits the category of other people. What happens to the people that don't follow after Christ? We're seeing them listed here. Notice, if you don't mind, there's a third guy here. Verse number 61, we have another man here. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first. Oh, there's that let me first again. Me first. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. So here's a guy who says, I'll follow you, God. But, but before I do that, uh, I need to go back home and I need to say goodbye to them. And what's happening is that even though he says he needs to do this, there's this idea that he wants to go back and say goodbye. Well, well why is that a big deal? Because there's an idea that he wants to go back and the people talk him out of it. I'm willing to follow after God, but you know, 
Before I do that, let me go check with everyone else. Let me go make sure that this is all right. Uh, let me go. <laughs> Someone said that the, the second guy, his delay was because he loved his father. The third one delayed because he loved his mama. Mom, is it all right if I go? Mom, can I go to church? Mom, can I do this? Mom, I want to go to Bible college. Is that all right? Mom. And it has the idea that he has these strings attached that are keeping him from following after him. There's these strings. In fact, hold your finger here and turn with me, if you don't mind, to the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Speaking directly of following after Christ. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. We're coming back to Luke, so don't lose your page there. 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> this is clearly in context of discipleship. For context's sake, let's start in verse 1. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, Paul is talking to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou, Timothy, has heard of me, Paul, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Clearly, the context is discipleship. He's supposed to take the same things that Paul taught him and teach others. Notice verse 3. Thou therefore, so because of this discipleship, because of this idea, thou Timothy therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There's that first man's objection, isn't it? It's too hard. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. Now what he's referring to is that the Roman soldiers of that day, when they are called to be a Roman soldier, they're not allowed to own a business. They're not allowed to own land. They're not even allowed to be married without special dispensation. Why? Because the Roman government, when they went to war, they didn't need their soldiers giving them excuse of why they couldn't go out to battle. Oh, I can't, but the crops are fixing to come in. Oh, I can't, but my business. Oh, I can't, because my... What he's saying is that no man that warreth entangleth... And by the way, we're in a spiritual warfare. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. But let me first. He's looking back. He says, I can't. I'm entangled. I can't follow you because I've got other things that I need to do. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of his life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Our goal should be pleasing God. It shouldn't be us first. It's God first. Let's go back to Luke 11. So this man comes up and says, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bid them good, uh, farewell, which are at my household. And he has the idea that he still has strings attached. Notice what Jesus says, verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now here's a farming tool. Remember, we got the old days of plowing. All right? And so as they had the plows, they're supposed to make straight rows so they can make the best use of the land. And so as they're taking the time to plow, as you're doing the work you're supposed to do, and you look back, you're going to turn the plow and it's no longer going to be straight. And if you look back, instead of having straight rows and they're all like this, well, you're not going to get a good crop. It's, you're not using all the land effectively and efficiently. And no man who's given a task to follow after God, what is the idea of following God? Keep your eyes on Him. Keep looking at Him. You're either going to be looking at Him or you're looking at something else. And if we're going to be straight, if we're going to be discipleship, if we're going to do what God's given us to do, we have to keep our eyes on Him. But when we keep looking at other things and, oh, we're not going to be fit to do the job we're called to do. But let me first. You can't keep looking at the past if you're going to follow after God because you're going forward. You can't be looking back. You start from where you are and move forward. As long as you keep looking at your past, as long as you keep looking at the thing you're entangled with, you're not going to be moving forward. So here are three people. 
three people that were given the opportunity to follow after God. The first one didn't follow after God because it was too difficult, too inconvenient. The second one had the idea he didn't want to follow God at God's timing. God said, follow me now. And he gave excuse. I'll do it later. I'll do it when this is fulfilled. I'll do this when this is taken here. Uh, he gives some excuse after another of why he can't follow after God right now. I'll follow God later. I'll follow God later. I'll do it later. And by the way, tomorrow never comes. If you're not willing to follow God now, you will not follow God next week or next year or in 10 years. Let me first. The death of discipleship. The third guy had too many entanglements. He wasn't going to keep his eyes on the Lord. He kept looking back, looking at the things that had him entangled, had him trapped, looking at mama's apron strings, holding him back from moving forward. He was stuck. And he wasn't fit to do the work because he wasn't able to keep his eyes on the Lord. His eyes were on other things. These three historical people also give the classification of why people aren't following God now. You see, it's either you've made a decision to follow after God, no turning back, no turning back, you're looking forward. Or you're giving some excuse of why you can't follow after God. Again, we're not talking about people who didn't hear Jesus. All three of these people heard Jesus. The first guy, his heart's warm. I'm going to follow after God until he realized it was going to be inconvenient. The second one, Jesus clearly told him, follow me. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a commandment. And instead of obeying, he gave an excuse. But let me first. Let me take care of this. I'll follow you later. I'll catch up with you. Let me take care of this first. And he gave every excuse of why he couldn't follow God now. And the third one, I'll follow after you, but he was indecisive. He had a heart in two worlds. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Either you'll love the one and hate the other. You have to choose this day who you're going to serve because you can't serve two masters. Is it going to be God or is there something else? You have to make a choice. Joshua stood up and said, hey, choose you which God you're going to serve, either the gods on the other side of the flood or choose God. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're making a decision. We're all making a decision. We're going to follow after him. There are so many times, even in a church like this, where people can sit on a pew for 30 years and never move forward. Why is it? Because they've never made a choice to follow after him. And all that time wasting, all that time fleeting that they could have used. Now, you can't do anything about the past. Don't worry about it. What are you going to do right now? You start from where you are and move forward. Start from where you are and move forward to follow after him. Why is it if Jesus himself was standing right in front of you, and by the way, because of the word of God, it's just like as if he was looking at you eyeball to eyeball. If he was looking at you and said, follow me, what would be your response? Yes, sir. I'll follow you no matter how inconvenient it is. Yes, sir. I'll follow you even though it's going to be tough. Yes, sir. Let's go. Or are you going to say, but me first. That's the death of discipleship. But me first. Your decision right here and now. And your decision is not between me and you. Your decision is between you and God. What are you going to tell him when he is clearly making a call? Follow me. What is your response to him? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time 
to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.